everyone today we are looking at endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gathers so this is actually our last lesson um, in the topic biopsychology before we move on to the next one you will already already be pretty familiar with endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gathers um, but in this lesson we are going to go into um, more detail on these two things. So we will understand the role of endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gabers on our sleep wake cycle. And then we will also evaluate the use of studies to support their role in the sleep wake cycle. Um, so just to begin, um, because you're already pretty familiar with most of these terms, I want you to write out your own understanding and your own definition of these terms and um, so light you might find quite difficult um, to define but try and link it to knowledge that we have learned previously based on light so you can pause this video here um, and then I will show you the answers right so these are the answers um, so we have endogenous pacemakers which is our internal body clock um, or is made of our internal body clocks and regulates many of our biological rhythms. One which we already know is our circadian rhythm. Um, and then you've got exogenous site gabers and that are external cues in the environment and they entrain our endogenous rhythms. Okay, so an example of this would be light, which we looked at already. Um, and endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gabers usually work together, particularly in our sleep awake cycle. And next we have the sleep wake cycle. So this is the daily cycle of biological activity based on a 24 hour period, also known as a circadian rhythm. Um, so when we sleep, when we engage in wakefulness, what happens? Um, usually at different times of the day, our blood pressures go up and down, our hunger is suppressed, um, melatonin is either inhibited or released at particular times and all of that is to do with our sleep wake cycle then you have the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, which is essentially our primary endogenous pacemaker um, so yeah uh, made up of a tiny bundle of nerve cells which we can find in the hypothalamus um, melatonin which is produced by our penile gland um, and governs the sleep wake cycle so like i said previously um, when our body knows it's time to sleep melatonin is usually produced to help us get into you know that feeling of being sleepy and when we wake up and it's time for our day to start um usually the melatonin is inhibited um light a zeitgeber in humans that can reset the main endogenous pacemaker and plays a role in the sleep awake cycle i believe that is supposed to say and lastly we have social cues which are schedules that are created by others so for example meal times we know we have breakfast in the morning and we have dinner in the evening and also bedtimes um it's you know usually created by our society so our social norm is to pretty much go to sleep um during the night that's our bedtime pretty much um so we we saw what happened without um light actual light our exogenous gate um zach gave and its influence on our endogenous pacemaker so when we leave in it when we leave it free running our um, biological clock is not actually 24 hours but sometimes it extends to 25 hours and like i said and um, we'll be going into further detail on endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gavers in this lesson um, so yeah make sure you green pen your answer um if there's any mistakes if there's anything you want to add on please um you know rectify um some of your mistakes all right so we've got the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, which is our main endogenous pacemaker um and the sen is usually found in the hypothalamus the hypothalamus in our brain and that is where the sen is based and it's involved usually in maintaining our circadian rhythm so the cells in our suprachiasmatic nucleus um usually contain biological clocks so 
this is the whole process um, of how it influences our sleep work, wake cycle. So usually our eyes receive a light which then travels to the hypothalamus and we know that um, in the hypothalamus the SEN is located in it and then the SEN contains our internal body clock um, which is made up of thousands of nerve cells these nerve fibers connect to our eye area um, called the optic chiasm. And so even when we are asleep, even when our eyes are closed, um, there's still information that is being passed through these different systems. And as a result, um, our biological clock is able to continue to adjust to daylight even when we are sleeping. So we have our SEN in our hypothalamus um, the cells contain the biological clock. Um, nerve fibers they connect to our eye and um, so our optic chiasm, chiasm to be specific so the SEM pretty much uses information from the optic chiasm to make adjustments to our circadian clock and we know it does this because even when we are asleep even when our eyes are closed um, we are still pretty much able to receive information from our environment so that we are able to manage and maintain um, these circadian rhythms so we have our first piece of research evidence um, based on the superchiasmatic nucleus and first we are using animal studies so i want you to put your evaluation hats on and um, you can already start thinking of some things to evaluate as i explain what the study involved so we have the coursey um, in 1998 and he wanted to look at um how um chipmunks would behave if their SEN was removed and um, so did it make a difference in their natural habitat did they still remain the same and um, so what he did is he gathered about 30 chipmunks um, and did lesions in these chipmunks so he took out their suprachiasmatic nucleus connections and compared them with a control group um, after that he observed them for about 80 days and found that after this these 80 days um loads more chipmunks had died whose um superchiasmatic nucleus had been taken out um when compared to a control group um so what they found was that mortality during the first 15, 14 days was 37.5 percent for surgical controls and 50 percent for the SEN lesion animal. So you can see that there was a huge difference between the controls and the um, chipmunks who had their um, SEN connections destroyed. I want you to think about what this actually suggests um, about the evolutionary benefits of the SEN and also what some ethical issues are. So we could say um, that this study actually emphasises the role of um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus in maintaining our circadian rhythm. Um, so it can also be sort of concluded um, that most of them were actually killed because they were awake and because they were awake that means that they may have been more vulnerable to being attacked and therefore um, because their SEN was unlikely to be able to maintain their circadian rhythm this led to um, them being killed and so the SEN actually provides some adaptive benefits and adaptive advantages in order for us to survive and so it's important already we can see from um, this study that our SEN is intact and we already know I guess what some ethical issues are um, so protection from harm do you think these chipmunks were protected were they able to give informed consent probably not okay so these are some ethical issues that you can start to think about um, and pick out for your evaluation the full article will be linked. Oh, let's see the conclusion. So therefore, this suggests that having a biological rhythm, such as the sleep wake cycle, does indeed aid survival. Okay, the chipmunks were likely to have stayed awake in their burrows at night and therefore be under more danger of predation due to the noise created. Okay, and this led them to be more susceptible to predators and therefore as a result killed. So I will link the full article up on show my homework 
and um, challenge yourself try and read it and prepare yourself for university because you'll be reading articles all day long so have a go um, and have a read of this particular article so we have our next um piece of research evidence um of the role of the SEN um, using animals again in this study. So we have Ralph et al, um, who bred mutant hamsters. So they removed their suprachiasmatic nuclei. So these hamsters, they had a sleep-wake cycle of about 20 hours um, and they had another set of participants, which were normal hamsters pretty much. And these hamsters had a sleep-wake cycle of 24 hours. Um, what they did was they transplant transplanted um, um, the suprachiasmatic nuclei of the mutant hamsters into the brains of the non-mutant hamsters. What they found is that essentially or eventually the non-mutant hamsters changed to the 20 hour cycle of the mutant hamsters. So what does this study show about the SEN? Um, and here are some other questions. What are the issues with applying this evidence to humans? So let's start off with the first question it again emphasizes the role of the SEN in maintaining um, our circadian rhythms our sleep wake cycle in terms of applying it to human beings can we truly extrapolate results and findings that are found with animals to human beings some might say yes because we have similar um, genes similar DNA and it were able to circumnavigate ethical issues that you would find in humans so would it be possible to do this study in human beings probably not and therefore people would argue that it would be better to do on animals however does this raise ethical issues absolutely um is it right that these researchers have done it um, and if you can try to refer to issues and debates so what sort of issues and debates arise with using animal studies and what issues and debates arise in general um using this kind of research so as we have seen both of the studies actually support the role of the suprachiasmatic nucleus in maintaining um the circadian rhythms which is i guess a good thing and um, because it's provided us with insight into how this um the SEN works and the importance of the SEN. However, there are some clear limitations, as we have seen, um, a lot of ethical issues that have been arising in both of these studies. And I hope you have been evaluating as we go. So thinking about some um, strengths um, and some limitations as well um, that arise with this study. So for example, was it okay to cause harm to the chipmunks in the study just for the purpose of research? So it's again this question, do the ends justify the means? Was it necessary in order to learn about um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus by putting chipmunks in harm's way? They could have probably started their own families by now, but unfortunately, as a result of research, um, they probably couldn't have been able to. So was it actually okay? Um, However, some people might argue um, that they use animals as a way to circumnavigate ethical issues. So could we learn in much detail about the role of SEN? We couldn't do these things on um, human beings as it will be seen as extremely unethical. But should it be different um, in the way that we treat animals and the way that we treat human beings? Um, and next is, can we actually generalise the findings of animals to human beings. So can we extrapolate these results? Um, does it make sense for us to use these findings to actually um, generalise it to the rest of um, human beings? Um, so what about our free will? So we could say linking to issues and debates, human beings um, may have, or they do have higher complex thinking skills, um, and so we have the free will and the ability to choose our own bedtimes and when we want to sleep. As some of you will know because you're sleeping at 3 a.m. But do these animals have the same um, free will as human beings? So is it possible to actually generalise or truly generalise? Um, there is another piece of research that I want you to read um, on page 48, I believe. It's page 48. 
um, and it's Damiola 2000 and I want you to try and counter argue the importance of the SEM and then I want you to if you can try and link it to jet lag so your information your knowledge on jet lag what do you know um, about jet lag okay so I hope you've read Damiola's um, research study um, and they found, or he, she found, sorry, that circadian rhythms could be altered, which suggests that there are other complex influences on the sleep-wake cycle. So it's not as um, rigid as we believe it to be. And here we can link it to jet lag. So I want you to quickly um, read this sort of extension and think about how you can link this to jet lag. Okay, so first we need to also think about what jet lag actually is so there are usually misconceptions um, associated with jet lag that it's mainly because you're traveling and because you're traveling um, you will experience certain symptoms so some of you might have actually had jet lag before so um, you might get headaches you might um, feel fatigue you might be extremely irritable etc so these are all symptoms of jet lag and it usually occurs um, when you're traveling um, through different time zones so um the uk and america follow different time zones um, and therefore it is harder for us to um sort of travel um east to west so um let's use the example of our biological clock again and um yeah jet lag happens mainly because um when we're crossing these time zones it's disrupting our natural circadian rhythm so if you think about it let's say it is um i'm just making this up um it's 12 i don't know 12 a.m in swaziland and it's um 3 p.m in london okay so imagine you are going from london to swaziland this would have severe impacts on your or will have severe disruptions on your internal body clock. So um, usually it happens or jet lag happens because there's a discrepancy between our internal time. So our biological clock, which is usually set to our London time, so GMT, and also the external time. So the time at our um, local destination. Um, so this causes significant unrest to our biological clock so to avoid jet lag you should go to bed earlier or later depending on whether you are going um east or west so if you are going if you have a i don't know a night flight from america and you want to go to london it'll probably be best to actually stay up on that flight as opposed to sleeping so that you are well adjusted when you get back to London to sleep when everyone else is sleeping and um, so that it doesn't have that much disturbance on your biological clock and um, but yeah jet lag shows disturbances to the um, SEN can affect our sleep wake cycle all right so the last endogenous pacemaker that we need to know and we've touched it a little touched on it a little bit and that is um the opposite chiasm so the SEM passes information about day length and light via the optic chiasm because I've just said it this is passed to the penal gland via a neural pathway during the night the penal gland increases its production of melatonin which helps to induce sleep so as you've pretty much seen um, from most of it most of it is that our internal body clock and our exogenous um, zeitgebers are constantly interacting. So light in our environment passes through our SEN. Our SEN passes this information using the optic chiasm to the penal gland. The penal gland then produces um, melatonin so that our bodies know that it's time to sleep. Um, and when the light levels are low, um, it helps to, you know, the, the, um, this information is passed on to the penal gland and therefore melatonin is then released um, which induces sleep um, causing our body to relax causing everything to slow down causing um, digestion to inhibit our bladder to inhibit and therefore lead us to being asleep so low light 
our optic chiasm in the eye. This stimulates the SEN. This information is this then passed on to the penile gland, which then produces melatonin. Um, the production of serotonin is enhanced. Our brain activity falls and essentially we fall asleep. Um, so that is the process um, in which our exogenous light gapers and endogenous pacemakers communicate in order to maintain and reset, I guess, our circadian rhythm. So what we've covered so far, the role of the SEN on our sleep-wake cycle and the importance of it, um, animal studies that supports the role of SEN. So whether we want to use chipmunks or whether we use hamsters, it's up to you. And some criticisms. So what are the issues of using animal research? Is it at all ethical to do so? Um, and peripheral oscillators working independently from the SEN showing sleep wake cycle is more complex than simply the SEN. So, peripheral oscillators are other areas in our bodies that have um, access or can have information on the light in our system, and it can also use it can also reset our circadian rhythm. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be um, our SEN, but there are other areas in our body um, which, you know, do this for us. So exogenous Zeitgebers. So from Seif's research, we know that in the absence of external cues, the free running clock that controls the sleep-wake cycle continues to tick. So we know this because of Seif. Um, so when he had no external cue, so when he had no daylight and just artificial light, he still was able to have a biological clock of up to 25 hours. So as we already know and as we've already seen, um, our sleep-wake cycle is both influenced by endogenous pacemakers, so our internal factors, as well as external factors. They both have an Im impact um, on our sleep-wake cycle. Um, so I have a question for you. How do light and social cues influence our sleep-wake cycles? So you can pause this video and write down your paragraph or your description on why you, how you think it does that. So let's start with light. So as we know, light is our main or key zeitgeber in being able to reset um, our internal body clock. Um, so light influences us because we know when it's time to wake up and when there's a lack of light, we know that it's time to sleep and therefore influences our um, um, bodily processes, even the secre secretion of hormones sometimes, that can have an impact on that and therefore we know when it's time to sleep. For example, what we saw um, when there were low, level, low levels of light, melatonin is usually produced from the penile gland, which leads us to feel sleepy and therefore um, slow down our brain activity um, and eventually helps us to fall asleep. Um, and then we have social cues, so things like bedtimes and things like mealtimes. If you think about a newborn baby, they're usually not on our sleep-wake cycle because um, they fall asleep pretty much every three hours, or wake up during the middle of the night, and they don't have the same sleep-wake cycle as adults. But as we know, as you get older, um, we're sort of entrained to follow the lead of our parents so our parents tell us when it's time to go to bed our parents tell us when it's time to sleep you're not going to, I mean when it's time to eat you're not going to eat at 3 a.m in the morning um, or 4 a.m in the morning and then go to sleep at 10 a.m it doesn't really work, work like that so social norms have sort of helped to entrain our circadian rhythms um, in the way that it is now however okay so we have the man who was blind from birth um, and he had a circadian rhythm of about 24.9 hours. Um, he had to use stimulants and sedatives to adjust his sleep-wake cycle to the standard 24 hours. This supports a biologically determined endogenous rhythm because the research shows that his innate biological rhythm was difficult to reset with the use of zeitgebers such as clocks um, and radios.
so yeah um we can say that maybe exogenous zeitgebers may be um, overemphasized or deemed too important um, whereas here we can see that even with these um exogenous zeitgebers so clocks and radios this still was not enough to reset his biological rhythm um, and we can also think about people living in arctic regions and um, so they have loads of daylight um, but are still able to sleep at night are still able to have a pretty normal sleep wake cycle and um, so maybe exogenous zeitgebers are not as important as we think it actually might be so there should be a sheet, um, <laughs> excuse me, there should be a sheet um, up on Show My Homework. You can complete it, colour code um, the evaluation points. Um, yeah. OK, so as always, we have an exam question to test um, our knowledge. So before we read through the exam question, I want you to think about um, a few things. I want you to think about what assessment objective um, it's assessing us on. What the question is actually asking us, so what are some command words, um, what key terms are important for us to know to be able to answer this question. OK, so read the item and then answer the question that follows. So here we have a scenario. Um, so again, that's, I guess, a clue um, to the assessment objective that it's assessing us on. Um, I'm guessing that we know that we usually need to use our scenarios in our answers and so try and think about what assessment objective that is but anyway all right so sam is a police officer she has just started working the night shift so as i go through this um question i'm going to highlight what i think is important in this scenario so she has just started working the night shift and after a week she finds that she has difficulty sleeping during the day wow my highlighting skills are not great um but yeah i think that could be important in our up and coming question so here are some difficulties already that she's having which could provide us some information in our answer um, she's become intense and irritable so, so these are some of the symptoms that she's experienced so sam is also worried that she is less alert during the night shift itself so she started um night shift she's finding it that she's unable so it's been quite short it's been a week she's unable to sleep during the day um, and therefore because she can't sleep during the day she's become intense and ir irritable also because she's not sleeping through the day she's less alert during the night shift so she's not able to do that so let's see what the question is asking us using your knowledge so our knowledge of something endogenous pacemakers and exogenous zach gabers explain sam's experiences so the question has referred to sam um so we know that we sort of need to refer to sam as well and we've got our key terms here endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gabers and um, so we know we need to talk about these things so i want you to pause this video i want you to answer the question and then there's a hint box to help you as well so think about all we have learned based on endogenous pacemakers and exogenous site gabers and their influence on our sleep wake cycle why is sam experiencing difficulties and um, so pause ask the question and then we'll come to some answers All right, so our mark scheme, we had our key terms. Um, so a definition of endogenous pacemakers, internal biological rhythms, um, exogenous site gabers, so external factors we know, which is light, for example. And therefore, moving to night shift means pacemakers try to impose inbuilt rhythm of sleep. But this is out of synchrony with um, the site gaber light. So the fact that um, she is doing a night shift it's not consistent with our actual regular sleep wake cycle because she there are low levels of light her body is pretty much telling her that it's time to go to sleep and as a result um she's not alert during um night shifts and also during the day she's unable to sleep because the zeitgebers are communicating alternative information so that's actually telling her to stay up um, which again is um, suggesting that the two are out of synchrony and makes it difficult for her to actually um, go to sleep. 
and then yeah this the disruption of her biological rhythm has led to disrupted sleep patterns um so that is why she's tense that is why she's irritable as a result of these things so if you are able to identify because the question did say your knowledge definition of these two key terms and why it's proved to be difficult for sam as well um then you should be okay if you have any questions please let me know um that is pretty much the end of our lesson today it has been quite a long lesson um but yeah if you have any issues um if you want me to re-explain something please let me know um and hopefully i'll be able to help you um but until then please make sure you upload your 12 marker on show my homework um and yeah have a good day everyone i'll see you later bye